So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome uh, to this um, seminar um, of uh, KM Center for Christian Worldwide together with the uh, Faculty of Divinity. So thanks for joining today. And for those who joined for the first time, uh, I'm Muthura Swami, the director of uh, CCCW. Today we have with us Professor Chandra Malamballi, uh, who will be uh, speaking to us. So introduce, uh, to introduce uh, Professor Malamballi, uh, he's currently a research scholar at the Clue Center for the Study of Constitutional Democracy at Boston College. His scholarship and teaching span the fields of modern South Asia, the British Empire, and global Christianity. So he's the author of four books and many articles. His works examine the intersection of religion, law, and society in India. His first three books, to start with, Christians and Public Life in Colonial South India, 1863 to 1937, Rutledge in 2004. And then the second one, Race, Religion, and Law in Colonial India, um, it is Cambridge University Press 2011, and Muslim Controversy in British India, which is again Cambridge uh, University Press 2017. So these three books examine the evolution of Christian, Muslim, and Hindu identities in relation to legal and political policies and print media. His most recent book with Oxford University Press, South Asia Christians, between Hindu and Muslim, um, on which he is going to talk to us today. So he described how the lives of Christians have been shaped by centuries of interaction with Hindus and Muslims of the Indian subcontinent. For those who want to purchase the book, uh, there is actually a code for 30% offer. Uh, so we got some um, you know, code printed, printed out here, but also it will be circulated to the whole mailing list. And, and please look for um, that. In 2021 to 22, uh, Professor Malambali was an inaugural and visiting scholar of World Christianity at Harvard Divinity School. His current research at the Flu Center explores the challenges facing India's diverse democracy. And his next project, which is already working on, the virtues of mixture, religion, labor, migrants, and cosmopolitanism in the Indian Ocean examines the experiences of cultural and racial mixture among South Indian labor migrants to the Persian Gulf and Southeast Asia, and whether their religious commitments either facilitated or impeded their capacity for inter-ethnic ties and world citizenship. Chandra, it is really wonderful to have you uh, today with us, and thank you very much for your time and your generosity. and. Um, um, I now hand over to you. So next 40, 40, 45 minutes for your presentation, then followed by um, conversations. Over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Mutaraj. And thank you for the kind introduction. And really good to see all of you. My only regret is that I could not be there in person. I've got uh, a long relationship with uh, Cambridge University and uh, I very much enjoyed my visit to Cambridge in the past. And yeah, it would have been nice to be there in person, but I've had a, a, a scheduling conflict with the uh, with conference here in, in Dublin. But I'm delighted to be here and would love for this opportunity to have a conversation about uh, my recent book, South Asia Christian. What I'd like to do is give you an overview of what that book is about. Um, it covers quite a bit of a territory, so I'm not going to give you the blow by blow, but I'll be painting with some pretty broad strokes and zooming in on some of the parts of the book that were per perhaps a bit more provocative in order to spark a discussion among us. And um, I'm sure there'll be plenty of time for q and I'm gonna go at a pretty good clip. And I also am going to upload my slides. Um, you, I'm trusting that you all can hear me okay, is that correct? Yes. yes. Okay. All right. I'm going to upload my slides. And so this book was uh, 
was a contribution to the Oxford Oxford Studies in World Christianity. It was a series of books edited by the late Laman Sane. And I've written this book at the behest of Laman as a contribution to this series. The targeted audience of this book are, yeah, yes, it, it does target a scholarly audience, but it's largely uh, targeting a general audience of people who are interested in the history of Christianity, interested in topics related to world Christianity. And I present it as a South, as, as the South Asia contribution to uh, the study of worldwide trends. And so I try to pitch it in the middle, um, addressing people that are looking at some of these, these aspects of history for the very first time, but also teasing the curiosity of people who've been in the field and are more familiar with um, the history of, of Christians in South Asia. So I, I present the book as a contribution to the study of global Christianity, but also to South Asia specialists, people who perhaps have not taken Christianity seriously enough as a facet of this history. I think um, South Asia specialists have done a good job of looking at Buddhism, uh, Hindu and Hinduism and Islam, perhaps could do a better job of looking critically and, and, and in a layered manner at uh, the history of Christians and with all of its uh, nuances and complexities. So um, let's take it, let's start out with the, with the broad overview. We're, we're quite familiar, I'm sure this, this audience is quite familiar with uh, what occasions the study of, of world Christianity is the dramatic demographic shift um, in the world's Christian population to what we refer to as the global South. I, personally have problems with that phrase, but <laughs> Africa, Asia, and Latin America now have um, a very large percentage, if not the majority of the world's Christians. And if you look at this uh, diagram that comes from study from the Pew Center, you can see that um, the Americas have a very large percentage of the world's Christians, but these concentric circles uh, are um, in regions of the world that don't uh, intersect with the Indian subcontinent. And I present that as somewhat of a paradox because the Indian subcontinent now contains one fourth of the world's uh, population. And uh, I mean, South Asia does, one fourth of the world's population. India is now the largest, the most populated country in the world. And yet um, in the study of world Christianity, um, it does not uh, capture the degree of attention that region possessing Christian majority uh, are receiving. And that's quite understandable that we would pay a lot of attention to Sub-Saharan Africa because we have 30 plus countries in Sub-Saharan Africa that have Christian majorities and the, and the growth has been explosive there, no question about it. The growth of unregistered churches in China has been um, very, very significant uh, in the Philippines, of course, in Latin America. Uh, but it's not necessarily the case that um, our scholarly inquiry has to follow the trends of demographics, which is why I'd like to make a case for why um, South Asia is still important to look at in the study of world Christianity, despite the fact that it may not appear to have this demographic surge that uh, we've seen in other parts of the global South. If you take a look at South Asia's numbers, you can see from recent census um, data that um, Sri Lanka has 7% uh, Christ Christian, but India, despite having uh, a Christian presence there for a couple of millennia, according to the census, is below 3%. Uh, now, 3% of 1.4 billion is still a lot of, <laughs> quite a few Christians, but in terms of the percentage of the whole population, it's quite low, and that is the character, that is pretty much the case with most uh, of the nations of South Asia. We're talking about below um, 7 percent or below. And so that might be one reason why perhaps um, it's not um, a region of the world that gets the kind of attention um, that other regions having this dramatic growth um, are receiving. Still, I want to make the case that South Asia's Christians are unique in the study of world Christianity for several reasons. Their stories are unique and they're very important to engage um, in uh, this region of the world. And one of them is because the Indian subcontinent 
is home to the great religious traditions of the world. Um, they've either originated there or they predominate there. There are more Muslims in South Asia than there are in the Middle East. There are more Muslims in South Asia than there are in Indonesia. Um, I mean, if you take India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, combine the, the population of Muslims. Um, so the great religions of the world are, are very well represented in South Asia. And it might be one of the reasons why um, you don't necessarily have this type of explosive growth. Um, it, that's not the main story in, in South Asia. But these, this history of interreligious interaction is one of the most uh, prominent themes of the book. And so uh, you have um, a region of the world that has a very large human footprint having um, a relatively small number of Christians, but that still makes it a very important region uh, for the study of, of Christianity because you, you, you have an opportunity to look at Christians in constant interaction with other religious subjectivities. If you look at the map, you can see that the Indian subcontinent extends, of course, into the Indian Ocean, but there is this connectivity of South Asia to uh, other regions of the world which has, is very longstanding um, through this uh, Indian Ocean, these Indian Ocean trade networks, through um, overland routes connecting South Asia to Persia, uh, sea routes connecting South Asia to the Arabian Peninsula, as well as to Southeast Asia. Um, India cannot help but, being, but be engaged with the world. And Christians of India cannot help but be engaged with, uh, with difference. It's such a, a, a prominent feature. So there's no such thing as an insular history of Christians in this part of the world. Another aspect of uh, South Asia, South Asia's Christians that makes them unique is the salience of uh, Dalit and tribal um, composition of the church. Uh, most of the people that have become Christian in South Asia come from highly oppressed and economically depressed communities and marginal communities, and they have been um, involved in, in, in mass conversion movement to Christianity during the 19th and 20th centuries. So in one sense, because of these, these mass movements among Dalits and tribals in Northeast India, in South India, even in Punjab, uh, there's a sense in which uh, South Asia even predates Africa in terms of the large explosive growth that happened in bursts in the 19th century, early 20th century. What I'm saying is if we do want to make demographics the real lens for uh, looking at um, world Christianity in any given part of the world, there's a case to be made that the demographic explosive growth um, arose in South Asia in a very pronounced way, but it happened earlier. Uh, and it happened primarily among these two um, demographics, these two different demographics. Um, so with that, um, I'd just like to give you the outline of the book in some broad uh, strokes. The first chapter of the book talks about um, the oldest Christian tradition in India, the Thomas Christians. Uh, the picture in the middle um, is uh, a picture not of the Apostle Thomas, but of, uh, uh, of someone who led a revolt against uh, the Portuguese um, during uh, the 16th century. And the picture on the right is um, a depiction of the Thomas Christians by um, Portuguese settlers uh, during the 16th century, I believe the caption says something to the effect of the Christians of Malabar um, that were converted by the venturesome St. Thomas. Uh, and so this, this legacy of, uh, of the, that attributes this, this early uh, Christian community to the apost apostolic mission of, of Jesus as Apostle Thomas goes way back. Uh, it, 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 there's not enough evidence to prove without a shadow of a doubt that this actually happened. But what we do know is we have an early Christian community that goes back to the fourth century that at least has the historic memory of, of being started by Jesus's apostle Thomas. 
Um, so what do I do in this chapter? Uh, I take up this theme of interaction, uh, and I try to emphasize um, the interactions of the Thomas Christians with Persia. Uh, they were connected. They eventually became very connected with the Church of the East, based in Tessaphon, through trade, through the exchange of ecclesiastical personnel, and also through the settlement of Persians into um, South India. And so this is significant because when we talk about Indo-Persian influence and Indo-Persian um, exchange, we typically think about the history of Islam in South Asia and the Mughal Empire. But uh, the Thomas Christian Persian connection predates the Islamic uh, uh, Indo-Persian narrative by several centuries, quite a few centuries, in fact. So what you have in the story of the Thomas Christians is not only uh, the fact that they were in touch with, with Persia, but also they were thoroughly enculturated with, with, the, with the diverse landscape of South India. So they were interacting with um, local institutions. They were patronized by Hindu kings. Um, they identified themselves with the upper caste of South India, particularly the Nambudri Brahmins from the 8th century on. And they, they appropriated to themselves the symbol, the right, and the exclusive traditions that made them appear to be very high caste Indians. Uh, and th these are some of the things that made them very distinct. By the time Muslims arrived in India during um, the 8th and 9th centuries, uh, they lived side by side with the Thomas Christians along with Hindus. I would not say that the relationship was, con was completely peaceful. Um, and that it was all broken up when the Portuguese arrived. But it was a story of coexistence that's pretty remarkable um, when we look at um, Christian interactions with, with other traditions. So those are the themes that I develop um, in this chapter about the Thomas Christians. One last thing I would say about the Thomas Christians is that they're actually quite significant today in India at a time when people want to make the case that uh, Christianity is a foreign religion. Um, and along with Islam does not belong in India. Well, here is a community that is Christian that predates the arrival of Europeans by, by many, many centuries, predates the arrival of many Hindu movements by many centuries. And so you can't uh, argue that there was no Christianity in India before the arrival, the Portuguese, the British, or the French, or the Dutch, or whatever it might be. Um, so that makes, a pretty, uh, it's, it makes them pretty important to study. So moving right along, uh, a theme that I uh, develop in the book is one that I borrow from the economist Amartya Sen and also uh, the historian uh, Chris Bailey. Mm -hmm. That are very basic to the history of South Asia. The traditions of interrogation, the, the, the traditions of public interaction. So the image on the far left is, is an image of the, um, the philosopher, the woman philosopher from the 7th century BC, Gargi, um, having a, a very, very uh, energetic dialogue with her, her, her mentor, Yanya Valkya, about the nature of the soul, about the nature of rebirth, about um, the metaphysical questions. But it was, a, it was a relationship of constant questioning and interrogation, that too, uh, by a woman uh, of her, her male mentor. Uh, the, the image in the center is uh, from the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, it's uh, the disciple and warrior Arjuna um, having a dialogue with, uh, with Krishna on the battlefield of Kurukshetra and this, in, this constant uh, Q&A that takes place between the devotee and um, the Lord Krishna. And you can see that the same sort of dialogical posture um, is presented in Rob Roberto de Nobili on, in, in the image to the right. I'm sorry that I couldn't find a clearer image than that. <laughs> but this is Roberto de Nobili, um, the Jesuit uh, missionary um, to um, Madurai in South India. You can see the big temple at Madurai in the background. But he's seated in the posture of a, of a Hindu uh, ascetic. Um, he's raising his hand in, the, um, in gesturing like a sannyasi. 
and engaging in this dialogue with the Brahmins of South India. And I've used this argumentative concept as a lens for looking at the interactive heritage of Christians in South Asia. And that's a theme that runs through um, the course of the book. Um, I moved from the Thomas Christians to a discussion of Catholicism in, uh, in, in India, um, paying uh, beginning with a discussion of the uh, Mughal Emperor Akbar and the, um, the religious dialogues he hosted in his, um, in his house of worship. Um, you can see the image on the left. Um, you have members of different religions, um, uh, including Jesuits who are pictured in the, the blue robes and the caps uh, to Akbar's right. But uh, this chapter talks about uh, the third mission of the Jesuits to the courts of Akbar. Uh, and Akbar was someone who had a voracious appetite for interreligious dialogue. He was illiterate himself, but really wanted to learn. And um, we, we know about these and encounters with Akbar because the Jesuits wrote letters back to Europe describing in great detail their encounters with the emperor. And so we're getting their take on how Akbar received how Akbar received them and his receptiveness to Christian interaction. Um, one of the things that um, I point out in the chapter is that there seems to be a disconnect between the Jesuits' understanding of themselves and how important they were to Akbar and his, their sense of how close he was to becoming a Christian. They wanted to pull the Constantine thing, make, a, make an emperor out of, uh, make a Christian out of the emperor, Christianize the whole of India. But um, it appears that Akbar might not have been playing them, might not have been using them, um, but he was certainly teasing his own intellectual curiosity by having these dialogues and had no intention of, of becoming a Christian. And so there was always this disconnect, and that's something that I um, bring out in the book. Uh, the other image that um, on my screen is um, an image of Jesuits gifting the emperor with a polyglot Bible uh, and uh, him uh, expressing his appreciation by first kissing the Bible, then placing it on top of his head. And um, this and other illustrations in the chapter show that Akbar did have hold the Jesuits in very high esteem. And there's so many little anecdotes they tell uh, about his interactions with them that illustrate that. So this is once again uh, part of this argumentative tradition. The, the Jesuits did strike up debates um, with Muslims in Akbar's court. Sometimes the debate became quite feisty. <laughs> they were not illustrations of peaceful interreligious dialogue because they were on the cusp of violence. I mean, they were on the cusp of being beaten because they were um, saying things about the Prophet Muhammad that were very offensive. And there was one instance where Akbar had to intervene and um, ask the Jesuits to tone down their rhetoric and ask the Muslims to, his Muslim clerics to, to back off. Um, so this was, um, these were quite uh, energetic interactions. Uh, I wouldn't say that this is part of India's argumentative tradition alone. I think Islamic empires have typically invited, um, you know, Christians and Jewish scholars to the courts to engage in these interactions, but you do see a kind of uh, fusion of both traditions in these exchanges in Akbar's court. This chapter is followed by another chapter that is devoted to Catholicism in, uh, in South Asia. Uh, it's a chapter entitled Accommodation and Difference in South Indian Catholicism. Uh, and that deals with um, this whole question of um, did Catholics blend in to such a degree that um, they cease to retain um, the distinctiveness of their doctrine and their creeds and their their orthodoxy, did they cross over too much? And that's the question that arises in the history of the Jesuits. So I move from there to um, a discussion of the Protestant legacy in India in particular, but South Asia more broadly. Uh, and um, you can see on this slide that I have um, an image of Bartholomew Ziegenbog, the first Protestant missionary to India along with William Carey, often referred to as the, the father of modern missions. And what's important um, 
about this chapter in particular is that I emphasize that Protestant missionaries, in addition to being committed to propagating the Christian message, were committed to producing knowledge about India um, pr uh, through book printing, through uh, the study of language, through um, producing grammars and orthography, producing treatises on the religions of India, of, about Islam in India. And this knowledge production was part of a larger project of not simply producing Christians, but producing a Christian society in India, of, of having comprehensive impact and um, having an impact in this emerging public sphere. And I'll get back to that in a minute, but um, I'll just leave that uh, for now, this, this, commission, this commitment to knowledge production. Uh, which did not necessarily result in conversion, but resulted in a certain kind of um, transformation of public life in India, uh, especially with regard to religious exchanges. So according to um, Chris Bailey, um, India had this, uh, this tradition of argument, this ecumen, where you had this interrogation of what constitutes the good society, this interrogation of caste, this interrogation of patriarchy, these are longstanding argumentative exchanges in the history of India. Uh, but what Protestant missions did to the argumentative tradition in India, according to Bailey, is that they, they uh, subjected it to extraordinary strain because of their aggressive preaching um, practices um, their desire to publicly refute other religions, um, their desire to consistently undermine um, the validity of other traditions through their educational institutions. This is an image of Wilson College um, in the middle, it's an image of John Wilson, um, who was not only um, a very devoted educational mi missionary, but also um, you know, in the Scottish uh, uh, tradition of the Scottish Enlightenment, uh, someone very devoted to the apologetic approach um, to engaging um, with other traditions, other religious traditions in India. But that had a cumulative effect in South Asia. So I do take some time to talk about the Protestant impact um, in, in South Asia as distinct from the Catholic impact. And one of the uh, aspects, the two aspects that I focus on are um, apologetics and translation as two, uh, a two-pronged um, dimension of uh, their, missionary, um, their missionary strategy. The effects of uh, apologetics in South Asia um, was, were not to produce large numbers of converts. The effects of this apologetic approach was ultimately to draw others into the public sphere to debate Christians and to push back. So that was the large effect, is that it created a climate of interreligious competition. And that would, to me, is one of the longest lasting legacies of the Protestant impact in South Asia, is this catalyst for other subjectivities who appropriated their methods and did the same thing that they were doing through the adoption of print and printing presses, through their own apologetics, which were often anti-Christian. And um, this is very well documented by, by many different scholars, um, including Avril Powell and Richard Young, talking about the, these exchanges and how it actually produced uh, non-Christian subjectivity that had never existed before in the public sphere on that scale it, it, with that degree of visibility and um, this um, the platform that um, they would eventually seize for themselves in the public domain. Uh, the other aspect of uh, translation in South Asia um, is, is quite an important uh, distinction that can be drawn between the effects of translation in um, African contexts that are discussed by uh, Lamansane um, and to some and, and also Andrew. Uh, translation uh, was a part belonged to a process of making Christianity local 
And um, it was a process by which the gospel was owned, incarnated, and appropriated by people uh, in Africa. It was, it was almost like the antithesis of colonial imposition because it was, it was the word of God being translated into the mother tongues of, of Africans. You have this taking place in, in South Asia as well, but what does not happen in South Asia is that it does not become a catalyst of Christian nationalism. Okay, Sana makes, Sana makes the case that the translation of the Bible into African mother tongue released something in the African imagination that inclined them to in- interrogate colonial rule and produced um, African nationalism. It also produced African Christian majority in many different parts of Africa when there was this large scale appropriation and conversion. What you have in South Asia is the Bible being translated into mother tongues and it catalyzing other forms of translation and printing, but it led to a cultural renaissance that was not necessarily putting Christians at the cutting edge. You have Hindus and Muslims doing the same thing, translating their texts, um, disseminating their texts, disseminating their apologetics, and beginning to really celebrate their mother tongue without having any reference to Christianity. So a great case study is Samathi Ramaswamy's study of, of Tamil devotionalism. Okay, we know that Bartholomew Degenbog was a great student of Tamil and translated um, many parts of the Bible into the Tamil language and um, uh, did publish many tracts relating to Indian religions. Um, and, but what takes place, what eventually gets off the ground in many regions of India where Christians established printing presses was the production of a devotion to language, a regionalism that was not necessarily favoring Christianity in any way or promoting Christian growth in any way, but was sometimes militating against um, invade against Christian influence. And so that would be another uh, distinction between uh, South Asia and parts of the world that produce Christian majority. Um, The impact of apologetics and translation in South Asia was tied up with the production of non-Christian subjectivities. I'm not saying that this was the only factor that produced a new Hinduism or a new Islam um, or a new Parsiism, but it was a huge factor <laughs> that woke them up and brought them into the public sphere, into a sphere of engagement, and ultimately um, into a place where Christianity was marginalized, especially in the era after colonialism. And so you have, once again, another contrast between um, the, the story of African Christianity. And the story of South Asian Christianity is that after colonialism, you see this explosive growth of Christianity in, in, uh, in Kenya, in Nigeria, in, um, in, in parts of South Africa. But after colonialism, uh, Christianity becomes marginalized and um, objects of suspicion that this, this is a religion that, of the foreigner that's intent on using inducements to convert other people. And so in South Asia, um, Christianity, especially Protestant missions, is a catalyst for, for Indian nationalism, but it's also the other of Christian nationalism, I mean, uh, of, of nationalism. Uh, Christianity through print, through translation, through um, debate in the public sphere, had the effect of catalyzing Indian nationalism, but that Indian nationalism emerged and made an other out of Christian and made an other out of Islam. And that is paradoxical. Um, and that's different from what we see in other parts of the world. And so that is uh, a contrast that I would draw there, uh, which makes um, Christians in South Asia quite important to look at, especially in light of um, the kinds of things that are taking place um, in South Asia today with resurgent nationalism. Um, 
So the last section of my book deals with the emergence of Dalit Christianity and tribal Christianity. Uh, it begins with the story of mass conversions um, that take place in um, a number of regions of South Asia, um, including Punjab, um, including various parts of South India and um, Northeast India. So I talk about all of these regions in, the, in, in these chapters. Um, this is a picture of a mass baptism uh, outside of Hyderabad. And um, what I develop in these chapters is oh, over about three, three chapters is a trajectory, a, um, the, a, a variety of pa uh, stages in the passage of uh, converts. Um, you have the mass, mass conversions that take place in the 19th century. But what you have after the mass conversion are a lot of questions about whether um, these, these people that have undergone baptism have consolidated a bona fide Christian identity or not. This is an anxiety that was very pervasive among um, the missionaries in the Punjab. Um, these were uh, not only um, Protestants of the LMS, but also the Capuchins that worked among the um, sanitary workers that were converting to Christianity. The question of, okay, um, are these converts literate enough? Are they trained enough? Have they been catechized properly? Have they been instructed? Was the pedagogy effective enough to give them a profound grasp of what it means to be Christian? And uh, these missionaries were consistently vexed by the, the challenge of constituting a Christian subject out of these mass converts. And so there was a persistent question um, of whether they are converting for other reasons, for material reasons, for access to resources of the missionaries, um, for uh, aid during times of famine, for humanitarian aid. And what I argue is that this question about sincerity and authenticity in conversion begins in missionary discourse. It, it begins with the kinds of questions that missionaries themselves were raising about their converts, but it is eventually appropriated by opponents of the missionary enterprise. Uh, and so uh, if, if, if Christian missionaries themselves question the authenticity of their own converts, why can't Gandhi? Uh, why can't... Um, the uh, writers to local newspapers who are saying these are all right Christians, these are all opportunists. And that is a discourse that has sustained itself to the present day. Uh, and so what um, I think we need to do is really understand this, this, leg, this li link in the chain, this position of identity limbo, because there's probably a lot more going on here than um, a failure of Christian pedagogy that keeps them in limbo, that keeps, keeps a Christian um, having a kind of hybrid self uh, where they are participating in village life and th their old rituals and their old practices, but also attending church and uh, being catechized and being instructed. Um, there was this passage between the old and the new that never seemed to be effaced, even by somebody like uh, V.S. Azariah, the Bishop of, of South India. Um, and so this whole narrative of backsliding, are they consistently backsliding into their own ways? Or is this really a different form of Christian expression, this dual multiple participation? Uh, from there, I do talk a little bit about Dalit Christian identity and the emergence of Dalit Christian theology and some of the tropes. And in the last chapter of my book, I talk about um, the transition of many uh, converts who found their homes in Church of South India churches or Church of North India churches and their passage into uh, Pentecostalism, not simply their passage into Pentecostalism, but also the passage of higher caste Christians, as well as uh, people from the St. The St. Thomas tradition, the Syrian, or the Syrian Christian tradition, their passage into Pentecostalism as well. The epicenter of Pentecostalism in India is really the state of Kerala. They have the most broadcasting networks. Um, they have very large churches 
Of course, you have some mega churches in other parts of, of India as well. But this is a very important phenomenon to look at in South Asia is um, the, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to skip over parts of this. Are the emergence is the, is the allure and the attraction of, of Pentecostalism. Um, and uh, the um, emphasis that is placed on the Spirit, on the Holy Spirit, this is where I end the book, is this uh, discussion of Pentecostal movement. Uh, and I talk about the uh, allure, the attraction of Pentecostalism, the um, emphasis on the Spirit, the participatory and democratic nature of Pentecostal, um, Pentecostal movement that draw women and um, people of very diverse castes, including Dalits, into the actual, the active ministry of the church and the experience of, of uh, the divine. Um, you can see that women are very salient in the picture on the right. The picture on the left is a Pentecostal gathering in Chennai, a healing ministry. And um, this significant growth of Pentecostal is also accompanied in the day, in the era of of, with, of the BJP's rise to power with a spike in anti-Christian violence. And according to a study by Chad Bowman um, and another study by Sarveshwar Sahu, um, the most frequent targets of anti-Christian violence in India today are Pentecostals. And um, you know, in my book, I ask the question: Why is it that Pentecostals are so frequently targeted and are so frequent objects of, of violence in South Asia. And um, the answer that Chad Bowman, uh, uh, the, the, the historian at Butler University gives is that Pentecostals are unusually provocative. They engage in the rhetoric of rupture. They are attacking other religions. They are emphasizing the radical break um, with uh, with other religions when one becomes a Christian. And um, they invoke the language of spiritual warfare and the demonic world, the battle with the demonic world. And it's very confrontational language. That is Chad Bowman's um, uh, perspective. I push back on that just a bit <laughs> in my approach to this. And I've looked at many Pentecostal churches in Kerala and in Hyderabad and in Chennai. And um, the case that I tried to make is that Pentecostals are not attacked because they attack others. Pentecostals are attacked because they attract. And it's very different uh, to be a movement that attracts than a movement that attacks. Uh, they attract others to their emotionalism, to their uh, affective participation in the ministry of the church, to the, the sense of belonging that they cultivate among persons of diverse caste background. And so this is one uh, space where Dalits can mingle and mix with persons of other caste. And this mm -hmm. is something that came through in a number of interviews that I conducted in um, producing that last chapter of the book, is this is one domain where um, where there is this uh, sense of affective citizenship. Uh, this is a this is a term that is used to describe uh, political communities, but I really think that it can be used to understand the growth of of some religious communities like Pentecostals that produce a high degree of belonging, and because of their music and the kind of effective joy that they generate for a lot of people, they grow in numbers. And it's not because they're out there giving sermons that are attacking Hindus or Buddhists or whatever it might be. They are drawing people into um, their, their services and the services that they provide. And this raises some very interesting questions relating to anti-conversion laws in India. Because anti-conversion laws are they, they prohibit conversion by force, fraud, or inducement, where mm -hmm. inducement is interpreted very broadly. It's interpreted as offering somebody a job, offering somebody money, offering somebody admission in a school, or 
any sort of humanitarian aid in exchange for conversion. That's outlawed. What about offering somebody an opportunity to feel good? <laughs> is an affective good? Uh, is, is it how do you how does it fall within the the scope of an anti-conversion um, law? What about affective belonging? It's not tangible at what in what sense does this enter the province of the law, especially anti-conversion law? So it creates uh, some very problematic challenges. Uh, the typical form of violence that are experienced by Pentecostals is they could be having a prayer meeting or a service, usually in a suburban area or in a village, and they will be, you know, uh, uh, the, the church the mob of Hindus would come into the church and ransack the church and physically accost the pastor, even accost women. This is something that's happening with rising frequency. It's intimidation being used. And instead of the assailants being placed under arrest, it's usually the pastors that are being placed under arrest. And why are they being arrested? Because they're being accused of hurting Hindu sentiment with their preaching and accused of um, inducing people to becoming Christian. There was even an instance a couple years ago of effigies of Santa Claus being burnt in the streets of Agra and Delhi. The claim being made that Santa Claus is a Christian symbol who is being used as a device to lure children into Christianity. Um, and so this, this concept of inducement um, and the idea that all conversions to Christianity are inauthentic, they are induced, they are exploitations of, of, of the poor is something that um, is a trope that that has quite a bit of a lifespan in India. So I don't want to um, conclude on that type of a note, but um, I think I've talked enough, but I've given you pretty much the scope of the book from the Thomas Christian through um, Pentecostals and the surge of anti-Christian violence and the BJP's rise to power. Um, and that's really the, tra the arc of the book. So I'm gonna stop there and um, open the floor um, to your comment and your questions.